grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, fellow redeemed. Today's Gospel reading stops a little too soon. Jesus says, and this we heard, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The verses that immediately follow really kind of put into focus the words we've just heard. Simon Peter asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. I think so often we can relate to Simon Peter because he was sort of forthright and brash and uh, kind of spoke bravely, bravado, sometimes boastfully. And he had all these good intentions. And oftentimes those good intentions fell short. Have you ever been there? Especially when it comes to our faith, our devotion to our Lord, our promises made to Him. The disciple boldly proclaimed his loyalty to Jesus, even willing to die for Him. And a matter of hours later, a maiden in a courtyard would say, aren't you one of His followers? And he would swear up and down he never knew him. It's hard to imagine the emotion, the feeling, the intensity, the sadness that must have assailed Jesus at times like these. When those who swore their love for him and their loyalty to him We're just offering lip service and fail to follow through. What does he do? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing grace. He looks over the city of Jerusalem and mourns for her. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I long to gather you and your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Jerusalem. Do you know the meaning of that name? Jeru, place. Salem, similar to the Hebrew word shalom, peace. Jerusalem, place of peace. Really? Isn't this the place where King Herod... Uh, publicly had an affair with his sister-in-law, his brother Philip's wife, Herodias? Isn't this the place where when John the Baptist publicly condemned Herod's behavior, 
He had him thrown in prison. This place of peace, isn't this where Herod at a party in order to save face commanded that John the Baptist be beheaded? Jerusalem, the gem in the center of the city, the temple, where they had money changers, making it convenient for people who forgot or maybe at the last minute decided maybe they ought to offer a sacrifice to God and they certainly weren't prepared for that, but, well, it's now convenient. I can just go ahead and purchase whatever I need or take care of it. My father's house will be a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. Jerusalem, where the original religious establishment, the Pharisees, the scribes, sought to silence Jesus by putting him to death. Why? Because he was making things uncomfortable for them. And how does Jesus respond to all of this human sin? How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. How often? Well, another lesson with Simon Peter. How he asks, well, how often should I forgive somebody? Seven times? To the Jew, seven was sort of a magic number. That meant completeness. And Jesus came back and said, no, let's try it a little bit more. Let's say, uh, how about 70 times seven? And he's not giving a mathematical formula there. He's simply stressing the fact that this forgiveness, this love that Jesus demonstrates that we should emulate is Boundless. And then the disciples tried to discourage him going to this place of peace, the city of Jerusalem, because it was well known that there were threats of assassination going about. Lord, that's too dangerous for you to go there. But he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he was on a mission. His mission was to offer his life as the ultimate sacrifice, the sinless one paying the price to redeem sinners like you and like me. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you. The love of Jesus The will of the Father was this. God made him, Jesus, his son, to be sin. Not just to bear sin, but to be sin. He who knew no sin, sin did not touch his life. Not in birth and not in activity or life. He was sinless. And the Father made him to be sin so that in him we might receive the righteousness of God. A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. What's it like under the wing of of Jesus. Well, look around you. Look at these people that you are in the company of at this very moment. What brought you here? What brought you together? You know a better question? Who brought you together? John says in his Gospel, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
Luther says it so beautifully in the Catechism as he explains the third article to the Apostles' Creed. Luther writes, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. Every time we gather under wing, we do so by God's design. And we find tremendous protection and providence in such a gathering. Did you hear about the little boy who woke up in the middle of the night and he had had a nightmare, a bad dream, and it had frightened him, and the room was dark, and he called out to his parents in the next bedroom. He asked for somebody to help him. And mom kind of woke up but was still quite groggy, and she just kind of called back to him and said, it's okay, it's all right. We're right over here, and you know Jesus is with you. He'll take care of you. He loves you. And there was a pause, and the little guy was kind of pondering all of these thoughts, I suppose. And finally he speaks up and he says, I know Jesus loves me, but could you send somebody in here with skin on? And that's what life under the wing is all about, fellow redeemed. You know, we gather around the word and the sacrament, the means of grace, and through baptism we're buried with Christ so that we have newness of life just as he rose from the dead. Through Holy Communion we stay in touch with Christ and his real presence. And through the word we are taught and corrected and inspired by his divine truth. Through prayer, we speak to our God who listens to us and answers us always in all kinds of ways. Our words of encouragement and witness, thy kingdom comes to us and to others. Our anthems, our hymns, our songs give glory to God as we offer prayers and praise. That's the dynamic. That's the action going on under the wings of that Savior of ours as he gathers us. But it doesn't just stop here. It doesn't just stay within this sanctuary or within each other's company, but it branches out. And that's what Jesus said in today's gospel when he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the things that comes down through history as the world observed this movement called initially the way, the Christian faith, named after the Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. People who observed it from the outside and noticed just how those people relate and protect and provide for one another said, behold, how they love one another. That's exactly what Jesus was promoting when he said, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our life under wing equips us for ministry, serving others, as Jesus did. In your congregation, you're looking forward to the arrival of a new resident pastor. As a matter of fact, you'll be able to see the call service and find out the identity, the name of this new shepherd, under shepherd, that's coming into your midst. I congratulate you, but more than that, I commend you 
to do the work of ministry in support of what he leads us to do here in this place. Behold how they love one another. Is that something that uh, is often associated with society at large? Hardly. And yet, within the kingdom, within the Christian faith, the movement of the way, that love exhibits itself not only within our midst, but to those outside looking in. And that's the way God's Holy Spirit does his work of bringing others to the faith, causing that movement to catch fire and more and more people being, becoming devoted disciples of our Lord Jesus. Seeking thy will on earth as it is in heaven receives God's wonderful blessing. And that's what we are, blessed to be a blessing. In closing, I want to share with you a parable that kind of illustrates how this works. Because sometimes being a devoted disciple of Jesus, as Simon Peter would be the first to say, it, is not always comfortable. Sometimes it can be very challenging to follow Jesus in the pathway of love, to love one another as he has loved us. A parable, a modern day parable, if you will. At first, I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like the president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I didn't really know him. But later on, when I recognized this higher power, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride. But it was a tandem bike. And I noticed that God was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we exchange places, but life has not been the same since. Life with my higher power, that is. God makes life exciting. But when he took the lead, it was all that I could do to hang on. He knew delightful paths up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. Even though it looked like madness, he would say, pedal. I worried and I was anxious and I asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into an adventure. When I'd say, I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing and acceptance and joy. They gave me their gifts to take on my journey, our journey, God's and mine, and we were off again. He said, give the gifts away. They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met. And I found that in giving, I received, and our burden became light. At first, I did not trust him in control of my life. I thought, he's going to wreck it. But he knows bike secrets. He knows how to make it lean to take sharp curves and corners and dodge large rocks and speed through scary passages. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful constant companion. And when I'm sure at the end of the day I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, pedal, pedal, amen. May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, for loving one another. And may we, he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 
Amen.